Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Roofstock, the leading online marketplace for buying and selling leased single-family homes. Are you interested in adding rental real estate to your portfolio? A recent white paper called The Rate of Return on Everything examined global asset class returns all the way back to 1870 and concluded that residential real estate, not equity, has been the best long-run investment over the course of modern history. Roofstock offers quality pre-screen, single-family rental homes located in some of the best real estate markets in the country, with quality tenants already in place paying rent. And now, you can find all of this without ever leaving your own home. Roofstock is making what used to be an incredibly long and difficult researching and buying process fast and simple. That's because they do lots of the work for you by vetting properties, tenants, and property management companies so you can have all the info you need to find the right investment for you. Generating great income from rental properties has never been simpler. To learn more, visit roofstock.com forward slash meb. Again, that's roofstock.com forward slash meb. And now, on to the show. Hello, podcast listeners. We are very excited to be here today in sunny Incline Village, Nevada, Lake Tahoe, one of my old homes. This feels like homecoming to me, so I'm super excited to have Mike McDaniel here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It feels a little funny to say welcome to the show because we're at your conference. This is the Risk Allies Fearless Investment Summit. We're just following up on Joe Theismann and a bunch of other great speakers, but it's almost criminal to be here indoors right now, so we'll keep this short. But for those who don't know who are listening in virtually, we're doing this in front of a live audience recording in Tahoe. Mike's the CEO and founder of Risk Allies, but also is a practitioner and manages his own wealth management shop. Will you give us like a quick one-minute overview for the people listening in on the pod on uh, kind of your origin story and how, how you got to be here? Yeah, my, my origin story is pretty quick. Started uh, started off out of college wanting to, to be an entrepreneur, and I thought hardware stores would probably be where I'd, I'd hit the landmine. So I spent four to six months managing a hardware store with, a, with my finance background, and it was actually my financial advisor that told me I was an idiot for being in hardware and told me I needed to get my license and, and, and go after advising other folks. And uh, started off in the wirehouse space, went into the independent space, and now I own an RAA here in, in uh, just over the hill in California. So it's kind of like the old expression: he's like not not only a client, the founder of Riskalyze, but also a practitioner user too. Yeah, it sounds cliche, <laughs> but we often say Riskalyze is built by advisors for advisors. So it's kind of funny to listen to about the hardware because you at least realized that way before you mean Amazon came and is, is dominating every retail store on the planet. All right. So let's talk a little bit. Let's talk about your investment framework in general, um, how you think about investing. And, and you can tie in some of the ideas that led you to start Riskalyze as well, but just how you think about the world of, of investing. What's your approach um, as a practitioner with these, with these clients? Yeah, my approach is easy. I try to let the market do as much of the work as possible. And I firmly believe that the one of the biggest aspects or conditions that will lead to success is simply just being invested, right? So at the same time, I know that humans have just a very bad propensity to gauge or, I guess, overcome the emotional pitfalls of investing. And I believe that the, the easiest way to overcome that is to use, to quantify the risk, understand it, set expectations, and that empowers you to invest fearlessly is, is how we put that. So my investment philosophy is how can I get you basically as invested as I can, knowing that someday the you know what's going to hit the fan and I don't want you to sell, right? In fact, I would like to try to talk you into taking whatever cash or, or money you've got on the sidelines and, and adding more. So I want to figure out the, basically the point right before you become a stupid investor. And I want to invest you right up to that point. 
And I do that you know, with a, a core foundation of investments, and then I have a satellite approach uh, dependent on the client's you know, needs, obviously, and what they're, kind of what tickles their fancy. And so th- this kind of led to the development of the Risklize risk number. And may- maybe you know, the, the audience here is already familiar. Maybe give the listeners on the pod just a real quick overview of what that is. Because to me, the beauty of it is that it took a pain point for a lot of advisors, and I know you guys have over something like 20,000 advisors that use this and turned it into almost one, a lead gym, but something that they could at least talk to the, the clients on a behavioral level. And we talk a lot about psychology on this podcast and keeping all of us from doing dumber things that we're already trying to do. And so real, real quick overview of that, and then we'll kind of get into some uh, some other offshoots. Yeah, basically where, where Riskalyze started in my head, this is probably going back 2006. You know, so the company started in 2011, but in 2006, we, we knew that there was some intellectual property and this behavioral finance field known as, we, we refer to it as Adam, amount-driven asset management. The amounts that are at risk make all the difference, right? Humans are horrible about converting percentages. You know, you can say, hey, you're going to lose 8%, and they have a very tough time understanding what that actually means. They'll nod like they do, but they don't. But using amounts that are specific to the investor is paramount. So here we are in Nevada, Right. If you go into the casino, if you're like me and my brothers and friends that I, I gamble with, and I, we, you know, we like to play 21 or Texas Hold'em, in this case, a, a blackjack table. When you walk into a casino, if you're normal, you're going to walk around and you're going to look for one of two things. One is the table that's having a hell of a good time, right? Or you're going to look for what is the minimum bet. The odds at every one of those tables are the exact same, but the amount you're placing at risk is, is the variable. And so we wanted to address that, attack that head on, because we knew in the, in the typical process between an advisor and a client, you get to bubble in whether your client is conservative, moderate, or my favorite, moderately conservative or aggressive. What about, what about moderately aggressive? Oh, that's, yeah, I love <laughs> that one. Conservatively aggressive. Yeah, I, I love that one. So I, you know, not to go off too much on a tangent, but we're you know, about five minutes in, it's about time to derail. I have... I don't know how many years worth, 10 years worth of agendas that I've saved with with meeting with my clients. And in so many of them, I have the word conservative circled. And it goes something like this. So would you consider yourself a a speculative investor or a conservative investor? That's how I'd frame the question. And nine times out of 10, they're going to say, yeah, I'm definitely a conservative investor. Okay, great. So years later, now that we have risk lies, we can quantify how much risk the investor wants, what their risk preference is. The clients that were unhappy that they weren't beating the market and told me they're a conservative had a different definition of conservative, right? I'm a risk number 33. So conservative to me is a 33 or maybe even below. I uh, think of a, a client, um, Gary, and I had, I think it was six years worth of agendas that had a conservative circled as his, his goal. In his mind, conservative was, I just don't want to take any more risk in the stock market. The stock market's a risk number 78. So no wonder he wasn't thrilled every year. I was having to express to myself, like, here's, you know, we're, we're crushing it for a conservative account. We're, we're up, you know, 14% in 2013. And he's like, yeah, but my neighbor... In the market, you're up 33%. Uh, old Mr. FOMO. The, um, so just to give the listeners some perspective, the risk number goes 0 to 100 and give us some data points. So if S&P 500 is 78, what's 100? Is that just like one stock? Yeah, Twitter stock okay. or a very high, high vol. You know, and zero would be something like T-bills or no? Yeah, I would say T-bills are probably a 10-ish. So okay, so cash. We don't ever do zero, but yeah, okay. cash would be, okay. it, it'd be a one. It's like, it, and so a 60-40 would be what? Roughly a 50. Okay, 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 great. It was fun talking to you about this last night over, over a, a beer because you said originally you started doing some of this work in Excel. Yeah. You know, and then over the years it kind of developed. Kind of give us a little bit of perspective on how that number has changed um, over the years or how the the development of the risk number has been kind of refined? We spent 2011, 2012 refining that. And we really wanted to go to the market in 2013 with something that had already been more than tested. It had been battle tested and and it worked. So from 2013 to now, we haven't had to meddle with it much. We've got a, a great blog post uh, that goes into the accuracy that we've had with our, it's a six month range. It's the downside of that range that we index to the risk number. And we've had phenomenal success with that. So it's one of those, if, it, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But that's the, probably the, the quickest way to answer that. And, and so how much uh, historical data is it looking at? Is it six months or is there more that goes into the model? Yeah, or what's great it? question. So when we look at the 
calculation of the risk number. We were taken in three core components. There's a volatility component, Mm -hmm. a correlation component, and then we've got to figure out where we want to set the mean of that distribution, and that's the return component. And when we look at the data that we're collecting and using for the standard deviation and correlation, we want to have a, a conservative view on it. What I mean by that is if you look at the traditional software or analytic tool, they're going to go back and do a one, three, or five year trailing typically. And for us right now, that would only include data from very, call it easy markets. And so we actually go back to collect our data for volatility and and correlation to January 1st, 2008, Mm -hmm. because we want to include the hell that was 2008, you know, correlations went to one, volatility spiked. We want that data in our risk number. I saw a recent article that you were talking to someone where you talked about investing being broken. And you said there was two main reasons why, and you may not remember. I don't know how much PR you do. Absolutely. This is the, this is what drives risk allies. We truly believe and and we're building a moat, you know, movement to overcome this, but there's two reasons that we think pre- that investing is broken. And, and we think about this through the main street investor, through what I re- lovingly refer to as a mom and pop investor. Number one is the psychological pitfalls that all of us have as humans. We've got to, we've got to overcome that. The second is the complex nature of the investing you know, environment. So you look at one asset manager who's here this weekend, First Trust. First Trust is unit investment trusts, exchange traded funds, mutual funds, separately managed accounts. So I think about my mom going to meet with an advisor and having them you know, explain to them or try to explain to them UITs and ETFs and mutual funds. My mom's not getting, my mom's brilliant, but she's not getting five minutes into that before her eyes glaze over and she's, she does not understand where this conversation's going. And so that's when we look at overcoming the two, you know, ter- two areas of investing that are broken, we believe it's psychology. And so we overcome that with quantifying, again, the risk number and quantifying some things, setting expectations so we can be behavioral coaches. Uh, and then just making it easy to understand. And one of the nice thing you guys do is it's not just quantified in percentages, it's also quantified in dollar amounts, right? And so a lot of people, we had a, on the podcast last week, an advisor who was talking, he said, I have um, a couple that came in, you know, and they said, we have a, a moderate portfolio or whatnot. And he said, I talked to them individually and the husband was super aggressive, could take on as much risk as possible. And the wife said, I don't want to lose. He's like, how much are you comfortable losing? And she said, zero. I mean, not a hundred dollars, not a thousand dollars, not ten thousand dollars, hundred thousand, zero. And so, you know, despite the fact that the two would average out to being in the middle, it's it's complicated. And so, we've seen, you know, Vanguard talks a lot about this with their studies, where they say the benefits of a financial advisor. One of the biggest ones is the behavioral coaching, you know, and keeping people from doing the dumb stuff. And advisors aren't necessarily always immune to, you know, the two thousand eights of the world or certain market events can can be challenging as well. In this world that's evolving, where one could make the argument that a diversified asset allocation is becoming a commodity, meaning the vanguards of the world and a lot of the fee pressures, advisors can go out and buy that portfolio. Um, I think ETF.com does a, the cheapest portfolio in the world. A diversified portfolio is now down to like five basis points. So it's essentially almost free. And a lot of people don't know this, and particularly with ETFs, there's a lot of ETFs out there that also do short lending. And so there's many, many ETFs that actually, the good guys do, they return the short lending to the investor. So there's actually a lot of ETFs out there that have a negative expense ratio, which is really cool to think about. So all of a sudden, we live in this world where you could buy the global portfolio for, let's call it 10 basis points. But really, it might even be zero or free once you take into the short lending. So, and there's been a lot of talk of this, so you may be sick of it. But let's talk a little bit about the advisor value add in a world where potentially the portfolio construction process is the least value add. You know, what the other areas, how have you seen this kind of over the past 10 years really evolve? And we have opinions on it, but would love to hear what, what do you guys think? Yeah, absolutely. We wholeheartedly believe that advisor's key role is to be the behavioral coach. Mm-hmm. And yes, expenses are, are important, but so is talking someone off of a ledge at the wrong time or any time. I've got you know, multiple, steer- multiple stories with my own practice, and we hear from advisors all the time the power that using data, analytics, in an easy-to-understand format can have on keeping that investor invested. 
And so that's going to be, I think, a considerably larger amount of focus, practice management, et cetera, with advisors focusing on just that, how to be a coach. And so, um, but I looked up a, a wonderful article you guys used to do called the worst portfolios in the world or something like yeah. that <laughs> from the wirehouses. The domain doesn't work anymore. So you guys don't talk about it as much, but you Soccer. guys are probably like, okay, Cupid does with dating. You guys probably have so much analytics into what advisors are doing and investors and your own personal experience. What are the kind of the mistakes that you think, um, um, and this is mostly probably aimed at individual investors, but what, what are the mistakes they continue to make that are the most obvious? I'm sure that selling at the bottom and getting FOMO at the top, but, but what are kind of like, what do you continue to see these days? Yeah, that's a great question. I'd love answering this question because we have data to support it. And I have multiple, I'll, t- I'll tell it in a story, both myself and, and, a, and a, an advisor that uses Riskalyze. So he calls me up and he goes, Mike, you know, I've heard you talk. I've read some of your stuff. I love what you guys do. I subscribe to Riskalyze. I threw all my client portfolios in there. There's something wrong. I said, okay, explain it to me. So he says, all of my clients' risk numbers, all their portfolios, I should say, are clustered around a 65 on the risk scale. There's just no way. I know I've got little old ladies. I've got you know, college kids. There's something wrong. So I, I ruminated on that for a couple of days. Like, what could he be talking about? Like, how, you know, does he just have a weird portfolio composition? Like, you know, I, I got permission. I went in and looked at some of his portfolios. Racked my brain three days. Finally, it hit me. It's the same thing I was doing in my practice. My risk number was a 34. And I would anchor my clients at a 34. If they told me they were aggressive, I might get them up to a 50. Because to me, 50 is like driving in the dark with your eyes closed. I couldn't deal with it. Well, it turns out every investor, to your point of the, the couple with different risk numbers or risk preferences, everybody's different. And so when you quantify that, you're able to see that an investor that, again, going back to semantics and quantifying, an investor that may say they're conservative may want just as much risk as the market has. So what we see is a propensity for advisors to invest their clients like they would want to invest, right? And there's some fiduciary aspect to that, I believe. So I don't think it's a necessarily a bad thing, but the data can show... And it helps explain to the advisor, okay, that's why Gary wasn't thrilled that we had a 22% return in 13. He wanted 33% and he could stomach it, right? So there's a big difference there. I think that's one of the things that, at least for me, from, a, from an advisor's perspective, is extremely important. Now, from the investor's perspective, that would lead me to believe that as an investor that's interviewing an advisor, you might want to ask what your advisor's risk number is. Mm. That's a great point. You know, thinking about, um, and we used to always tell investors too, we said, you know, it's not out of the question to ask your advisor how they invest their own money. You know, because a lot of people, I remember talking to a a famous investor once and he says, Meb, or he's he's giving a speech and he was saying to the audience, he says, you know, I'm going big. I'm making a huge allocation to gold or whatever it was. I think it was gold, but let's just use gold. And, you know, I pulled him aside afterwards and chatting. I said, oh, you know, like, that's amazing. Like gold, you're super bullish. Like how much, like when you say huge, is that like half your portfolio? He's like, oh no, I'm moving from like a 2% position to like four, you know, but to him that was huge. I mean, he, and he keeps like a quarter in cash. Yeah, going so. back to subject, you know, subjective terms that we use, you know, and we have a president that likes to use one, right? Huge. Huge. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. So when we, when we look at, we're huge fans, and, I, and I'm not just saying that. When we have new employees that are, you know, we're a fintech company. We have empl- in, employees, team members of risk allies that come in, and we give them kind of an indoctrination into the, into the industry. So I do a couple of spiels, et cetera, and then I give them resources. And it's actually your blog is one of those resources. And when I have somebody that comes it's up. It's the resource when you say, when you have insomnia on a Friday no, night, no, you want no, to go no, to bed, no. go read this blog. You want to learn about you know, finance in a way that's basically no BS, Meb's your guy. I, and I mean, there's only two or three people that I'll list there because I don't want to get out if I you know, send them off to Bernie Madoff or whatever. So you're one of those for sure. And what I love on that question of yours is that I have folks all the time ask us because we have, I don't know, 20,000 strategists in the system. And they go to conferences and they hear their talking head get up there and say, you know, I'm going huge in this or we're taking this big bet. And and they go, what do you think? And I said, ask him where his money's invested. Hmm. Like, I don't know many people have the stones to say, here's how I'm invested. And you're one of them. There's this great stat when we talk about skin in the game and Morningstar does studies about mutual fund managers and the percent and how much they have invested in their own fund. And there's 
on the like balanced asset allocation funds, it's something like 60% have nothing invested in their own fund. This is the PM. And 70% have less than a hundred grand. So, so it's like, why would I ever buy this fund? If you're sitting here telling me that you don't even own any, you know? And so it it actually be, that'd be an interesting study for you guys. If you haven't already done it to say, all right, we're going to take all of our advisors and look at their risk score and compare it to their client's risk score and see if it lines up. It's probably makes sense. Yeah. It's the, the one thing that's, I guess, an obstacle to that is the risk score is calculated using real dollars. Right, so an advisor's got to go in and say my portfolio is worth X, and then go through the process and then come up with a risk score. That's one thing. The second is when you look at investing, and, and this is true to myself, the hardest portfolio for me to manage is my own portfolio. And I can remember ten years ago, you know, coming home and I couldn't tell anybody else because I'm a financial advisor. But I told my wife, "Hey, I just tried to trade in and out of this stock and got my ass handed to me." Mm-hmm. And she's like, looks at me like, you know. You don't do that for your clients, do you? Yeah. I said, God, no, I'd never do that for my clients. And she looks at me dead in the face and she goes, then why the hell are you doing it for yourself? Mike, sounds like you need a financial advisor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I think there's actually a business there, frankly. Well, it's, you know, it's funny to think because I've set up automated investing for my own portfolio. And it's when you think about it and you think about it with clients, it seems to me a trend that I don't know why many people would go back to doing things the old way. You talk about the wirehouse to RIA model. You don't see people swimming upstream that much going from independent RIA to wirehouse, right? You don't see people going from a two to 3% mutual fund, selling it, you know, buying a cheap ETF and saying, you know what, I'm going to go buy that really expensive mutual. I mean, there are exceptions. We have a lot of friends that run high fee ETFs, mutual funds, hedge funds, and are probably worth it. But in general, for broad-based kind of commentary, I think in general, that's the trend. Let's pause for a moment to hear again from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Roofstock, the leading online marketplace for buying and selling leased single-family rental homes. I actually interviewed Roofstock's founders, Gary and Gregor, back in episode 63, and I was genuinely impressed with how these guys are radically simplifying rental real estate investing. The process used to be incredibly time-intensive. First, you had to identify a market, look at tons of homes, then do some due diligence, make some offers, negotiate the price, and finally buy, and then... You had to find a property manager to handle leasing and operations for you. What a nightmare. I've always been gun shy about rental real estate investing due to these various operational headaches that can come with it. But Roofstock has changed all that. Every one of these properties comes leased up and pre-certified by the Roofstock team. They even connect you with vetted property managers who handle all of the day-to-day headaches for you. They browse properties all over the country, including locally here in Los Angeles and even my hometown in Winston-Salem and learn more about how to generate real estate income with peace of mind, visit roofstock.com forward slash meb. Again, that's roofstock.com forward slash meb. And now back to the show. Let me ask you, what are you most excited about these days? You know, you guys had some interesting developments with the company. You're talking about scenarios. I don't want to lead the question, so that that may be something. But what what else are you working on that you're you're excited about? Yeah, I would say that my biggest excitement right now after going through the pain of starting our own company, 401k, Hmm. and as an advisor that frankly has given up on 401ks, the last 401k I took into my practice has got to be over 10 years ago. They were just, they're, they're PETAs. They're so difficult on so many different levels. You know, you've got to find a TPA and then a little bit of technology. You've got to find a fiduciary or a manager. You've got to find just too many different things you've got to plug and play or try to plug and play. They don't talk to each other, et cetera. It's, it's intimidating. And at the end of the day, you probably get paid half of what you get paid in, in your normal business. So I, I abandoned 401ks 10 years ago in my practice. And what we, you know, we look around the, this room and, and the audience we need advisors to be in the 401k space. Talking about the impact of behavioral coaching on, again, Main Street investors, that's where they invest. You know, as advisors, that's likely how we're going to suggest. When we see a, a younger, new investor and they say, what should I be doing? Well, if you're getting a match at work, you're probably nuts to tell them to invest anywhere else until they hit that match. This is a great description for the, some of the best business ideas are, is like frustration arbitrage. Like what's an area that just generates so much frustration frustration that there has to be a good business model there. I mean, I just went through renting a car again at one of the traditional, I mean, how is it still that miserable and bad and hard? There's, there was a Bay area startup that was great called silver car, but I was driving to Tahoe. So I needed an SUV and, and you know, it's such a miserable experience. So by the way, audience, we're going to ask you guys some Q and A. So start to think about some in a minute. I'm going to ask 
one more question and then we'll we'll kick it over to you guys. As an entrepreneur that's essentially started a few different companies, a failed hardware store, you get any ideas kicking around that you're thinking about these days? I mean, risk lies, you guys are continuing to innovate, et cetera. What 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 uh what good terrible ideas you've been brainstorming on lately? Yeah, I don't know whether to go with the the funnier more obscure. Both. Or, we got time. So yeah, so I, I I've got uh, and I think this is there's they somewhat exist and probably to explain the whole whole thing my wife's gonna be rolling her eyes when she listens to this is a bachelor box the bachelor box is taking new innovative or not so innovative products to the market think amazon and put to, having someone put together a box that is designed for bachelors and then going you know proving that as a success story you know we're talking cigars whiskey you name it. okay so wait l- l- let me clarify this is this meant for like a bachelor party is this meant for a, a gift box every month kind of like a birch box but for men it's a birch box for men eff- effectively and i think there's a bunch of different aspects of it but having folks effectively the product companies paying for placement mm-hmm. in there i think it's a good idea you know so one of my i mean i my wife also kills me because I ha- I subscribed to about a dozen of these boxes and I've invested in a couple because it's such a wonderful business model. It's reoccurring revenue, right? And most people forget that they've even subscribed to a lot of these, but then it's a pleasant surprise. It checks the behavioral box of you paid for it ahead of time so you don't see the payment and you get something in the mail. There's one that's kind of tangential. It's not designed towards men exactly, but it's called Bespoke Post, which is a pretty good box. And then there's a great website called Uncrate. Have you heard of this? That's a great one. So both of those are pretty cool, but you better reserve the domain before this podcast goes live (laughs) because someone else will run with it. All right. So was that the funny or obscure? Let's let's hear the other one. No, the other one is a little bit more practice, you know, for advisors or or more even just investors. And I think this, this occurred to me when I was on a fishing trip. I was going fly fishing, had a truck full of guys. None of us ever got away from the office. Each one of the guys in this truck were phenomenal individuals in their field. Mm -hmm. Two of the guys were in the steel business and listening to them on the way up there talk and they could see around corners in the steel. I mean, just, they could see around it. They see what China was doing with buying stuff in Japan and the guys that were buying places up in, in Oregon. And they, they could see around corners. These are guys with boots on the ground. They could see around corners. And I was just sitting there going, how can I capitalize on what stocks could I own? What sectors, you know, are going to be affected positive or negatively to this, right? The guy sitting behind me, I'm driving. The guy sitting behind me is a, this is now 2007, right? Mm-hmm. So real estate's to say as hot as an understatement. He's a special loan, basically bad loan guy. And he's at banks. There's no such thing as a bad loan right now. The guy's kind of at a, there's a low point in his career from a, from a revenue standpoint because nobody was defaulting on loans. And he's sitting there going, reversion to the mean is a bitch. Yeah. And he's sitting back there and he goes, you know, he studied and he studied and he studied. He's this doesn't, this can't happen. It can't continue like this. Right. So I've got two guys talking steel. I got a guy talking banking. And in both of those instances, they were spot on. Right. So take the, the wisdom of the crowd approach, but find individuals that really know their field and, you know, publish easy to understand content, stock ideas, etc. Long and short, I think there's something there. It's going to be the Riskalyze expert forum, maybe? I don't know. That's Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Curating and trying to find kind of the, the, the best ideas from the noise is something we struggle with on a daily basis. I mean, we talk about it a lot on the podcast with more and more podcasts coming out, more and more blog posts and news. How do you find the stuff that's actually really useful? I think as a business model, that's going to be a huge area for the next you know, few decades. And, and whether it's super siloed area, talking about artificial intelligence, or whether it's in focusing on one of the ideas that I'd love someone to do that we would subscribe to. If you think about advisors, all right, how many funds come out on a daily basis? And how hard is it to keep up with all of these funds? And we actually, ETFs get so much press, but we actually saw that there's been more mutual funds this year that have launched than ETFs. And particularly in the alternative space, so hard to keep up with and understand and separate the good from the bad. We always say we would love to subscribe to a professional publication that really looked at, focused on the liquid alt space, made recommendations, but really went and do deep dives. So I say, hey, you want to go into managed futures? Here's the 50 
50 funds that do it. Here's why these 10 are terrible. You should never think about giving them money. And because most advisors, like, I want that resource. And it's really hard. Morningstar does a, a decent job. But anyway, feel free to take it and run with that idea. Anyone? All right. Q&A. We got a little time. Is anybody here in the audience got any questions for the, the CIOs up here? Softballs only. Because if you don't, I'm just going to ask Mike my own questions. Well, you guys marinate on a second. This is a quiet... Okay, yes. So, uh, yesterday in one of your breakout sessions, we were talking about compliance. So, have with your 22,000 reps, have you had a deep dive SEC audit where the advisor was deeply entrenched in the risk allies and they used the models as a way of proving that they made good advice to the And let me kind of restate the question so that the the listeners in the podcast can hear it. The question was kind of about compliance and advisors that are using the risk-alized numbers that have been through SEC audits. By the way, we just finished one. <laughs> we love the SEC, if you're listening. The SEC audits, you know, have, have the risk alized numbers proven to be helpful or useful uh, as a part of that audit. Have you had any feedback there? We actually, we have. So mostly anecdotal, which is a good thing um, for us because anything else is probably going to be bad news, I guess. Uh, but the anecdotal stories is, are from advisors that say, hey, SEC came in, or I just had one with state auditors that came in, and you know, they ask, what is your process? They've got a, a full list of questions, and it was, you know, the way that this advisor answered the question to me was, when I told him I had a process and I mentioned your name, we skipped to the next question. It was kind of like they checked the box and they're off and running. So I think I think it's one of our biggest opportunities and obstacles early on is that when I speak at conferences or we're asked to speak at conferences on behalf of broker dealers or RAs, it's a it's a coin toss as to whether or not we've been invited there by their compliance department or the sales side of the house, which is extremely unique. Usually they're pitted against each other. And, and we've got this, this unique relationship as a compliance tool, so to speak, because we quantify and we have a process that help, can help you document that process. And we also help you retain your clients because they've got a great behavioral coach. I mean, the challenge I think that we face, but then I think probably almost every advisor in the country faces is almost all of 99.9% of them want to be compliant. They want to be doing the right thing. And the challenge is it's just such a massive amount of information and it's not like there's a simple playbook that the SEC gives you says, this is what you have to do to be, you know, and, and certain things help, of course, but giving this kind of sleep at night from an advisor standpoint that you're matching up expectations. So similar to relationships, you know, if you, if your wife or husband or parents or children, the worst possible thing you can happen is, is a mismatch between expectations and reality and getting surprised. And so that's probably where a lot of the, you know, compliance problems arise where grandma who wanted a conservative or aggressive portfolio and got the, the opposite. And I think that's why one of the reasons it really helps. More questions? Yes. So I've been a huge fan of the podcast. Uh, some, of, some of your guests in the past, one in particular I used to work with, and you know, has a mantra of don't take past events and extrapolate them forever into the future. And you know, what Mike said about the 401k business, I'm a very big 401k enthusiast. You know, it resonates with me very well because you know, Mike's not alone. There's a lot of advisors that feel the exact same way. I mean, question you know, for both of you guys, you know, what's going to be the big impetus that, that gets advisors that have a similar mindset to Mike to think about you know, strategic partners and pushing the easy button for that type of business so that they're not saying no to a massive entry rate of business? So the question came in that basically, you know, the 401k business has been a just dumpster fire, just a horrible, terrible, frustrating world. You know, what are, what are ways that advisors can think of entering and, and trying to cross that bridge into, you know, maybe making a part of their business? I hope and I expect that we're going to be a part of this. Our partnership with Vestwell is, we think, is, is just going to be an, an enormous opportunity for advisors to basically take back that space. And we think that there's... And what does that look like for the listeners that may not have heard the... Yeah, to take back that space is that many advisors just have given up on 401ks. They don't want to to advise 401k plans, so the, the employer and the participants. And it's because it is such a pain to do that, and you're not getting paid much uh, in the process. The allure what I refer to as a fantasy of the robo-advisor, which is I just put this button on my website and people trip and their checkbook falls into my account and it gets automatically managed by somebody. 
I do think is a fantasy. However, it's in the 401k space that I think we're going to, we're actually going to get to that, that allure. We're going to be able to deliver and execute on that in the 401k space before we're going to do that to the, the general investing public. And, and, and why techno- is that? The technology's there. And traditionally it's the 401k and especially the newer 401ks are going to have a younger participation, younger in age, and thus a little bit more, I guess, eager to be served from a technology aspect than the typical trust account that, you know, whale that typical advisors may be hunting right now. Any more questions? So 1966 treasuries were where they were last year and where people got killed in a 60-40 portfolio from 1960 to 62 was not only because equities were volatile, but more importantly because the bond market. So most 60-40 portfolios are depending on the bonds to be the catalyst that provides a stability in that portfolio, and then you have your risk number 33, 34, 40, right? But we're now not in a declining interest rate market. We're in a 25-year up cycle of interest rates. What is risk Alliance doing in looking at the portion of the portfolio that's supposed to be the stability aspect? What are some of the options that they're looking at? So the question was, if you look back historically, particularly for the 60-40 portfolio, the 70s really stunk. And almost everything did awful in the 70s. And bonds didn't help. And so thinking of a world where potentially bond rates go up and bonds don't help potential equity bear, how does risk guys think about either alternatives or other asset classes that may diversify that sort of portfolio? Or how do you think about the, the scenario where you may, you may have a low risk portfolio, but they both stink it up for a decade? Yeah, that's a, absolutely one of the probably top two pain points that we have and we hear from advisors, myself included. Number one, you have to start with the, the fact that cash is paying nothing or negative, right? And so you've got this feeling, especially the older generation, where they, the ones that don't like to lease or rent, right? They don't want their money sitting at zero interest rates. So they're saying, put this to work, right? Invariably, if they're in a 60-40, they should have a, quote, you know, low risk number, a conservative portfolio. So they typically look to bonds. And so one of the things that we empower advisors to do with our, our technology is put in a capital market assumption on interest rates. So 20 years, you know, rising, that's a gutsy call. You can put that into risk wise and show how that would impact a portfolio that's heavy in or has exposure to fixed income. And obviously, you know, show right alongside of that, a portfolio that's maybe using is either a strategic bond fund or an alternative that would fill in that, that gap. But you're exactly right. I think that's why there's more folks looking at managed futures as an example. You look at managed futures, this will probably take us down another road, but we have a lot of advisors that said, I never thought I'd be in or would ever look to sell an annuity, but I can't think of any other way, you know, that I can combat a rising interest rate environment. You do have uh, floating rate tips. You have interest positives, correlation, fixed income. Yeah, so you can definitely throw in ideas and then see how they'll fare. So, for example, if you throw throw in a long term treasury bond in one, in a portfolio, as the we'll call it the forty percent, and then in another account you throw in a floating rate fund at forty percent. Not that I would recommend that, but you can stress test those and see the impact between the two portfolios. So, that's the one of the most impactful pieces of risk is that, and my term that I use is, we make the math the bad cop. So you're not telling grandma not to own a bond because of you know some preconceived notion you have. It's, it's because we're at a low in interest rates. There's almost only one way for interest rates to go. Whether it's fast or slow, I don't know. But let's assume some, you know, some impact that's, you know, some rising interest rate environments can have some impact on a portfolio. Let's view the world through that lens and not make the mistake of just trusting, to Stephen's point, just trusting that whatever happened in the past is going to happen in the future. I got two more questions I'm going to ask. So if there's any more that we got to wind down on time here, sadly. Yeah. So standard to 
we're setting, we're setting people up for failure, and yet we're all judged based on our ability to perform compared to the standard. Uh, with this increase to sensation, how do you guys see your ability to be different? Uh, how do you position something like that when doing so puts you at business risk? Let me, let me try to rephrase the question and see if it's, it makes sense. You know, in a world of potentially low expected returns where, you know, almost every investment shop comes out and says, U.S. equities, you got to tamper down your expectations, bonds, you know what you're going to get. So that historical return that we've enjoyed in the U.S. and a lot of investors, if you read the surveys that expect 10% returns per year, even most, every pension fund in the country that accept, <laughs> expects 8%. How do you deal with that? Is that kind of the final question, or, or how, how? What are your solutions? So that's the framing. Of it. Okay, that's the framing. The question is really about how to balance the business risk that you face as a financial advisor against financial risk that your clients face, and that mismatch of time horizon between when a client is unwilling to keep trusting you and your portfolio is actually going to deliver. You got that? You want to go first? Yeah, I got that. So I, the way I look at it is, because I see this, if every advisor's chasing the same benchmark and has, has the same flavor ice cream, if everybody's just chocolate ice cream and you want to be a little bit different, that gives you a business risk, right? From a compliance standpoint and from a, hey, I took a, a risk in differentiating myself and I may pay for it if this risk doesn't pay off. And I think from a compl- from in both instances, I think number one, you have to have conviction. You have to be doing it in the best interest of the client from a fiduciary standpoint. But the extent that you're going to differentiate yourself from you know, the, the regular 60-40 type portfolio or 100% equity portfolio, to the extent that you're not going to be taking the, you know, the Kool-Aid of passive investing and just holding it is the extent that you need to have analytics that can prove why you would have made that decision. And I'm a firm believer that, you know, in my practice, I am, I have a very unique approach, I think, in the sense that I take bets on what I call my satellite positions. And my bets could be individual stocks, they could be sector ETFs. I want to try to add something that's a little bit different and that, frankly, keeps me involved, keeps me excited, keeps my, keeps my sword sharp. I actually think we talked about business ideas earlier. I think that there are so many ways that an advisor or a firm can differentiate themselves in this field. So you talk about no-cost e- ETFs. What about a, a portfolio that's 100% equities, right? There's no expense ratio in equities. That was one of our, we did a blog post called 17 million dollar and it had parentheses terrible. 17 terrible million dollar fintech ideas. You guys are welcome to steal them. That was one of them. We can expand on that on the, the follow-up podcast. You know, our approach on thoughts on this is, is pretty nuanced. We, we've talked a lot about this. And so thinking about the global market portfolio, if you just went out and bought the world and thinking about how other advisors do asset allocation, you know, we did a book on this that kind of showed that it didn't really matter what your asset allocation was over 10, 30, 40 years. It matters over the next year, but in general, as you have some U.S. stocks, some foreign bonds, some real estate, and mix it all together, you pretty much end up in the same place. We took, I think it was 15 asset allocation suggested strategies from Buffett, Ray Dalio, Mohamed El Arian, everyone, and compared them back to 1972. And the delta, if you exclude the permanent portfolio, because that's not really fair, because that has 50% in cash and bonds, those 15 portfolios only differed in performance by one percentage points per year. Right, And they had hugely different allocations. Some had 25% in gold, some had zero. Because the market environments kind of waxed and waned, you had inflationary 70s, disinflationary 80s and 90s and growth, but they, they varied hugely in any one decade. On top of that, let me comment... I don't actually think a lot of advisors have huge biases to the global market portfolio, whether they know it or not. And a good example is the average investor in the U.S. of their equity portion puts 70% in the U.S. And we saw the presentation earlier from First Trust. You know, the U.S. is half of world market cap. It's only a quarter of world GDP. But most U.S. investors put 70% in U.S. stocks. And that could be fine. It's been great since 08, 09. But that is an active bet. Whether you know it or not, you're making an active bet that the U.S. is going to outperform. So diversified, my first argument is most U.S. investors don't already have the market portfolio. Now, 
the way that we do it, my answer to this question, and this is personal, is that you know, we say, look, there's nothing wrong with buy and hold investing. It's great. We tilt away from market cap to value and momentum. So evidence-based, academic, peer-reviewed literature sort of ideas. And historically, that's a great way to invest. The challenge with buy and hold is you're kind of left to your own devices. And clients are saying you're not doing anything. And historically, the drawdown happens at the same time that there's bad, there's a recession, geopolitical news, people are losing their jobs. It all happens at once. Think 08, 09. 2000, 2003 is a little different, but most bear markets. And so my investment philosophy has always been trend following. And however, trend following has its, if you had to say Meb Desert Island, what would you take? I would say I would take trend following, but that has its own psychological challenges. It's hard to follow too. And it's hard to follow not usually because of the the bear market drawdowns. It's hard to follow because you look different. And often that means you look worse. And so at most trend following strategies, depending on the flavor, have performed poorly relative to the S&P since the bottom in 09. So you got to deal with FOMO. You got to deal with challenges of, of people. So what we've done is kind of what we call holistic. We put half in the global asset allocation market portfolio to give you a fundamental anchor of what's going on in the world. And then half in what we call this momentum and trend side. That way, people are never always invested in a binary outcome one way or the other. That's how we do it. On top of that, that we think that a lot of the world is much, much cheaper on the equity side than the U.S. is. The U.S. bond market is actually not that bad, ironically, because a lot of the developed markets have really low yields, some being negative. The most the opportunity there has been in emerging, but that's seen a phenomenal run. Anyway, there, there's a lot of different flavors you can do, and it really comes back to your philosophy as an advisor, but also what your clients can get them on board to, to behave well. That's the most important thing. So that could be 90% in T-bills and 10% in Ethereum. Who knows? Any more questions before I go to my last two? Top three trends? Um, okay, so the question is, is the question top three indicators or top three trends we see in the world? Oh, so I actually don't think the indicator really matters. If you look at the trend following funds, you put them all on a screen, they basically all do the same thing with the caveat that it is, so this is for the long-term trend followers. Um, some may be breakouts, some may be volatility, some may be moving average crossovers, whatever. In general, they're going to pick up the big moves and still get whipsawed on the side to side. That's my generic. I think there's a lot of parameter stability. So if you pick something like Paul Tudor Jones says, my starting point is always 200-day moving average. Something as simple as that. And we've written a lot on this, but for why it works and the reasons that it could be helpful. So I don't think the exact m- metric matters. And actually, you could diversify across metrics. So use three so that you're not binary all in or out. And a 1987 comes around and you're either the hero or, or the goat. But I, I think that is, you know, the challenge with trend following for a lot of people is the same as buy and hold is that it's hard to stick to. You know, when that trend, when you got to sell real estate in 07 and it's so hard to and you don't want to because real estate's just printing money or you got to buy you know and, and at a time when you don't want to buy anyway so I actually I don't really have a preference so they're all they're all wonderful to me it's like children they're all wonderful all right so we, we only have lim- we've already gone past our time so I'm gonna have to wind this down to two questions we can have you back on the podcast to get really deep on some other stuff personally your most memorable investment or trade now this can be good it can be bad you're not allowed to say children if you have them. You're not allowed to say your wife. Other than that, it, with, a, with an eye towards financial, what has been your most memorable investment? I have to say my most memorable investment was, and actually, can I do two of them? Yeah, because sure. They, they have the same, uh, the, the same trend, not to use a, an overused word, but uh, my first stockbroker. So I'm, I'm in high school. I've got a job. I've got some cash and I walk into it. So a, this is like Dean Witter. Yes. So I walk into the <laughs> yeah, office. Hutton. It was actually, I think, a Payne Weber, but okay. it might have been, been a, a Dean Witter. Walk into the office. I kid you not. Here's this high school kid wants to invest, and it's like a car lot. So I walk in, and this older guy begrudgingly, you know, like, fine, I'll talk to this kid, right? So I go in there. I've got, like, 200 bucks, and then, like, I'm going to do 50 bucks a month, right? I'm sure, you know, this is 25 years ago. So I tell the guy, I'm conservative, I'm conservative, I'm conservative. I'm sitting at his desk. And I'm not kidding. He's behind me, putting into a coffee cup. <laughs> sure. I, thought, I thought, boy, this guy's cool. Yeah. This guy's cool. Anyway, he invests me in a growth fund. And this is now 98 99 The market's at a pretty good tear. But there was a month 
when I got a statement on the wrong day to get a statement and my portfolio is down and I got the hell out of there, right? And if you look at the market and you pull back, it was a blip on a, on a phenomenal screen. But for me, I told the guy, I don't want to lose any money. I'm a conservative investor. What did he think? You're 18. You got umpteen years ahead of you. Like roll the dice, baby. So fast forward three or four years where I don't learn my lesson the first time. He said the Janus Internet Fund is conservative. If you have 30 years. Wait, did, did I spoil the story? <laughs> <You did. laughs> oh, man. I was going to I was going to go with the Jacobs. What was it? The Ryan Jacobs Internet Fund. There was like two or three really famous one. But the Janus. Was... So, it was, so the, the first one was not that fun. The second time around, didn't learn my lesson. Have an advisor. Tell, same story. My wife is in the room at this time. This is my life savings now. Right. I have a finance degree and I'm trusting this guy with my money. I'm conservative. I'm conservative. I want to invest, I want to use this as a down payment on my home. Same thing. He invested me in the Janus Technology Fund, right? You know what year that was. So that goes to hell in a handbasket and I get out again. That was actually the catalyst for risk starting. Like if nobody's going to listen to me, I'm going to do it myself, right? So I started quantifying it in a spreadsheet, which now, you know, has turned into the risk number. And this is kind of like, I mean, as advisors, it would be wonderful to have, I mean, I, I think it's a totally reasonable idea to have the young people that come in and say, look, here's the right thing for you probably to do with your portfolio, but we're, 20%, we're going to let you burn this to the ground. We're not going to say it that way, but why don't you try to learn? Maybe this will be your play account because it's so hard as an investor to write that lesson on paper. Hey, look, the stock market dropped 80% in the 30s. All right, got it. But to actually live through it, the pain of losing money is hard. Imp- almost impossible to replicate the psychological pain of it versus actually going through it. So trying to figure out a way to get people to, to lose money while they don't have any and they're young seems like a worthwhile tuition. Yeah, I would say the same thing. And we've had a number of folks that want to work at Riskalyze that have come to me or they're on a, a different team inside of Riskalyze that want to become one of my analysts. And I'll say, you know, how do you have your own money invested? And they're like, I don't invest yet, right? And I say, well... <laughs> There's no chance I'm going to have you on my team if you've never had money at risk. You have no business being on my team. Hmm. And I think it's the, the whole skin of the game concept. You reading books is one thing. You know, I can remember feeling like a rock star. This is in, in high school or, or even in college where I was, Yahoo had launched like this, you know, basically paper trade and account. Right. Everybody was paper trading, you know, in my. There's also the marketocracy. Do you remember that website? I think I do. They uh, then they eventually launched a mutual fund on it. And this was a site where you could go and put in your portfolio. And then the idea, which I think is a totally, it sounds like a reasonable idea, which was you could find the best portfolio managers anywhere. You know, it could be this kid in Iowa. It could be this professor in South Carolina. And they didn't have to be professional money managers. But it ended up, again, being a horrible, it, the fund actually still exists. Yeah, in this case, there was no money at risk, right? Yeah. It, was, it was pretend money. Yeah. And so you have all these, I can't tell you how many times I've heard this as an advisor, where you know, a guy says, hey, I think I've been maybe taking 100000 and doing my own, you know, out of my $2 million portfolio because I've been crushing it in my Yahoo account. And I go, your Yahoo account? I'm like, yeah, you, you put in trades and if you would have bought and if you would have sold and this and that, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well, so I think I'd like to try my hand in it. Invariably, you know, I'll, I'll absolutely, if it's not going to hurt them and derail them, I'll say, absolutely, take 10000 take 100000 Let's, frankly, educate you at how hard this is, right? Or, or another way we could do it where you set it up and let them trade, but every time they they trade, you take the opposite side. <laughs> so, <laughs> that, would, that would work. That would yeah. work. Um, but we spend a lot of time thinking about the behavioral ways to help people become better investors. And there's not a lot of easy solutions. And a lot of the ones that we come up with, even as kiddingly as that one, are, are tough. So was that both of them? We, got, we, co- we covered yeah. both? Okay, good. And it's funny because you know, almost everyone, their most memorable trade is a nasty loser. <laughs> it's yeah, like I, that's the one that's seared in your brain where for me it was trading biotech options and losing all my money. So it, um, those are, those are the things you remember in the, in the trouble with a lot of really young investors today, for example, is not having been through a bear market, you know, and having the expectations we talked about earlier being not aligned. All right. Last question. Favorite fishing spot near here. 
product Ooh. that you can <laughs> you that you to, can disclose. You want me to announce that not to the not world? your not your secret uh, pool, but where do you go? What's uh, the we're, so, we're yeah. in the Sierras here in in Tahoe. Yeah, the the my favorite place, probably just like a, a stock pick, is where I caught my largest fish, and that's on the the lower Truckee, right below Boca and Stampede Reservoir. There's a spot there I call the cave, and it's pristine. It's easy to get to, and. Uh, what what, what what were you using? Do you remember? What was it? Was it I, rainbow? I, I, I do remember. I took a client with me who wanted to get into the fly fishing. And, and the, this is a short story, but he was right next to me all day, right? And I'm teaching him. He's like a, having a 10-year-old with me, tying his flies for him, you know, in the whole nine yards. He finally makes his way maybe half a mile up the river, and, and boom, I land this fish. And I remember, like, lifting it out of the, out of the river, like, wanting to, wanted to have, like, somebody cheer with me because it was such a great event. And looking around, and it was just me and this fish. What's it's probably wow. a good. It's probably a good thing because it's like going golfing with your boss. Like you're supposed to lose. You're with your client. You got to let That's him true. catch that. That's true. But you also trust. You learn how much they trust you because you know fishing stories and all. But we get back to the truck, and I'm like, I. It was this big, and he looked at me like. Well, I don't know. The beauty of iPhones now is you can you can get some evidence. Good. Well, you'll have to take me some time. I love, love to, to fly fish, and hopefully we'll show you up, not vice versa. <laughs> Just kidding. No there's, comment. There's a, no, I'm, I'm fairly terrible. But um, I actually was reading a really funny article from Vaughn Chouinard, the uh, Patagonia founder, and he's like a lot of probably people who think about old enough in the asset management business where you spend so many years like studying and reading hundreds of books and really come back to almost a simple philosophy. Vaughn's like, I only use one fly and it doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter what fish I'm fishing for. And it's like a partridge pheasant tail or something like that. He's like, all I do is change the size and I have just as much success as I have on that as I do anything else. I thought that was a really just great metaphor. All right, Mike, where can people find you if they want to follow you, your writing, your work, everything's going on? Probably the easiest place is the Risk Lies blog at this time. I've, uh, I've been told that I have too big of a mouth to be on Twitter or social media with a company. So I try to honor that. Good. We'll add all this to the show notes. Mike, thanks so much for sending in today. Thank you. Uh, and we always end this with thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. 